Coming up next on Tech News Today, Ron Richards and I take a look at some CES gadgets. It's gadgets galore, including a bunch of Amazon Alexa integrations. Also, how routers seem to be really hot, starting with 2017 here. Uh, we try not to trip over the Curie home robot. It's very easy to do. You'll see why. Zuckerberg becomes a politician of sorts with his yearly challenge and the effects of robotic parents on newborns. All that and more coming up next on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today, episode 1675, recorded Tuesday, January 3rd, 2017. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. When it comes to the big decision of choosing a mortgage lender, work with one that has your best interest in mind. Use Rocket Mortgage for a transparent, trustworthy home loan process that's completely online at quickenloans.com slash TNT. And by Epson's new EcoTank printers with Epson's line of Super Tank all-in-one printers, you can print thousands of documents without running out of ink. EcoTank is loaded and ready to print when you are. Visit epson.com slash ecotank to find out more. And by Tracker, a coin-sized tracking device that pairs with your smartphone and keeps you from losing your most valued possessions. Visit thetracker.com right now and enter promo code TNT to receive a free Tracker Bravo with any purchase. Hello and welcome to Tech News Today. This is the show where we talk to you about technology. What, what else are we going to talk about when the name of the show is Tech News Today? We're going to talk about technology and technology as it relates to news and news as it relates to today. How's that? I'm Jason Owl. Joining me once again today because Megan Maroney is out until tomorrow. She'll be returning tomorrow is my friend Ron Richards. How's it going, Ron? It's good to be back. Thanks for having me, Jason. Great to have you back. It feels um, like just yesterday. It does feel like it, but I'm very excited. I avoided, I dodged the CES bullet. I'm not in Las Vegas this week. I'm very happy for that. I was there last year. This year, I like to do it every couple of years, but yeah. this year I'm home and I would really like to talk about all the announcements that happened today. So. <laughs> we weren't there, but we're going to talk about it anyway. Let's face yeah. it, when CES comes to, comes to Las Vegas, when it rolls into town, it like dries up the tech news that surrounds it. It seeps it into its pores and all you get is announcements from CES. That's that's pretty much what we're going to talk about for the majority well, of today's show. What I, what I find really funny from my experience of being at CES, I've gone a bunch of times already, and I actually, the years that I don't go, I'm more in tune with what's going on at CES than the years where I'm there yeah. on the ground. So true. Yeah. So it's true. Such because a monster. when you're there, yeah. there's so many distractions. Like, there's a lot of things you can, you can, you can like, get into your hands, you know? Like, you can play around yep. with the technology and everything, but so much is missed when you're out there walking from place to place because it's huge yep. and... I, I don't know. It's it's a different. You can, you can only you, you you can only be, go to so many presentations. You can only visit yeah. so many booths, and then you know it's a bear to get a signal or Wi-Fi because there's so many people there all online at the same time, and yep. so you find yourself back in your hotel room, huddled over your laptop, scrolling to try to see all the news. So yeah, this no way, way it's a. This is a lot easier to, to track the show. So there we go. That's so. right. Okay, so we've got a couple of blocks today about CES stuff. We're going to start with it. So why don't we? Uh, CES. Obviously, it's still a few days away. Officially, it starts on Thursday. Uh, but you wouldn't know it by the amount of products that are streaming in uh, from the pre-show events. So today, we'll check out a few of those more interesting announcements. First up is Lenovo, who has a few things on tap. First, uh, their entry into the Microsoft Windows holographic platform with its as-yet unnamed prototype VR headset. It has two front-facing cameras for mixed reality applications, they say. Inside out tracking, so you don't have to be, you know, you don't have to have cameras set up in the room in order for it to know what part of the room you're, you're located in. And two 1440 by 1440 OLED displays uh, inside that your eyes are graced with, um, besting the resolution of the Vive and the Rift. And I mean, as far as, <laughs> I mean, VR headsets, there's no, there's no way to say this VR headset looks really cool because they are <laughs> what they are, but this one doesn't look too bad. What do you think? This one looks neat. I mean, I, I think with this with this one and the the next story that we're going to talk about, it's almost as if sometime in in the summer, Lenovo is like, we've got to catch up, guys. 
Uh, you got to do this. They, you know, they're they're moving from you know they're established with the you know with their other various you know kind of hardware offerings. But it's neat to see them get into the VR game, and I think that this uh, this VR headset looks. I, I mean, it looks pretty cool to be honest. You know, and I think those specs are really interesting. You know, the inside out tracking and the two front facing cameras for the mixed reality kind of thing. Those are the those are the features that I look for in VR headsets now, as opposed to the closed exposure, because I want more. Of the, and Jason, you and I talked a lot of this, uh, but the immersive experience. Right. That utilizes the space around you as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and they're actually expecting to price this pretty reasonably, three to four hundred dollars. So you're not like, you know, you're not getting into that five or six hundred dollar range, which I'm imagining. You know, what is this even plugging into? So you're going to have some sort of system for yep. it to be running. So it's going to get expensive in other ways, but it's smaller, it's lighter than the Vive and the Rift. Uh, they do the kind of design approach with the with the the goggle that's similar to what uh, PlayStation VR does where they don't necessarily, you don't strap it to your head. Uh, it's more like it's suspended down in front of your eyes. And so it's just a different take on it. So I, I, and so, and in some ways it's more comfortable. So, yeah. And so now, and I haven't played with the PlayStation one yet, but I hope to soon. Um, the, the Microsoft windows holographic platform, does that include uh, HoloLens support? Yeah. So, um, they're going to have some HoloLens software that would be converted to this platform. I think that I think cool. that the answer to that is yes, partially. I, I, you know, you're not Please. getting the, you're not getting the total transparent view that you get out of the HoloLens, where it lets everything through. Like you really you have those yeah. cameras on this solution, so anything also, that you're getting that's you're augmented getting is passing through those cameras. Yeah, and you're also not going to get the the whole projection aspect of it as well, too. Right. Um, it's going to be more contained within the visor, but still, but that you know that that's a that, that's a platform that I'm keeping my eye on because I think that's going to be the game changer when it comes to VR. Yeah, and out of all the solutions, that's the one thing I have not had a chance to to throw on my eyes yet and yep. uh, and see for myself. So I'm very curious. Uh, anyways, that's that's cool. Uh, that might not be anywhere uh, near release to consumers, but Lenovo did <laughs> launch its own Echo competitor that will be available to consumers soon. It's called the Lenovo Smart Assistant. Uh, the device utilizes Alexa for its brains, Amazon's Alexa, of course, and skills integration. The, the, the design looks tall and cylindrical, a lot like the Echo, but the lower half more resembles like a Google Home with the kind of the fabric options down at the base, and you can get all colorful with those. Uh, the Smart Assistant starts at $129.99, the same price as a Google Home. That's also $50 less than the Echo. What do you think about this? I mean, again, it's like Lenovo woke up at some point <laughs> last year and like, listen, guys, we, we need to get in on these uh, home home devices. Um, I think it's really interesting that they kind of took the you know the design uh, approach of an Echo, but adding in the little Google Home customization, multiple colors, and all this stuff. It's a nice looking device. And I'm really curious what the deal with Amazon is for them. I mean, they've got to be licensing uh, the uh, the Alexa brains of it, but basically, like, hey, here, here's we're we're gonna allow you to undercut the Echo by fifty dollars with our software. I think that's an they must be paying a lot to Amazon in order to justify that. Well, yeah, Amazon's yeah. kind of opened up their Alexa, so that you, so you're yeah. we're, what we're starting to see now is that Alexa is being built into a lot of things. This included, right. um, they do have a more expensive uh, version of this. They have a hundred and eighty dollar version of this, a Harman uh, Harden Carmen model. <laughs> uh, I always have a hard time saying that for some reason. Yep. I get the the letters confused. Uh, anyways, improved base response, improved fidelity. So meant meant to be more like a a fully fledged, nice sounding speaker. Uh, yeah. set up with it eight mics which is one more than the echo up to see we got one more in there this uh, this one goes to 11 guys this yes, exactly <laughs> you got seven mics Puh, we got eight uh, apparently supposedly up to 16 feet of reach which you want out of these home appliances i mean overall we're gonna see more and more of these we're gonna talk about one at the very end of today's show we saved the best for last um this is just this is a category that Amazon came out of nowhere with a couple of years ago. It seemed ridiculous. The ad was ridiculous, yet it's really captured a lot of people's imagination. And now the category is starting to be taken more seriously by a lot of different uh, companies. Yeah, I feel I feel like the Echo was a bit of a slow burn when it first came yeah. out because it was kind of like you, you took, took a while to wrap your head around it. And as early adopters took the risk 
and then it kind of spread. And I think Google Home just kind of helped to bolster that, as well as the uh, Echo on Tap, the little the little hockey yeah, puck version yeah, of, of Echo, uh, because that's super affordable and and sometimes all people need. They don't need the big fancy speaker; they just want that little one. Um, I think this is yeah. I think a year and a half ago we wouldn't have predicted the explosion with Home Assistant devices, totally. but now it's one of the most exciting spaces in tech right now. So it's it's neat to see another entry into it. Um, although I still ally with Google Home, I still think that that gives me uh, the software, the Google Assistant gives me an edge over the Alexa platform, but I know Echo users are loyal. So, Well, we'll Echo see. users are loyal, and there's a lot of support around um, Echo uh, Alexa's skills. There's a lot yep. of, in fact, there's, there are more and more announcements coming out of CES about like smart appliances, you know, adding skills to, I mean, Echo's just been around for a couple of years now, and, and yep. with the kind of the skills ecosystem, that means that it's been around longest, it's kind of proven itself more than the other platforms, and so all these companies that want to expand the the capabilities of their smart devices uh, are kind of working in that direction seemingly first because it's been established as long. So Echo users end up benefiting pretty early on from a lot of things uh, at one time. Yep. Amazon teamed up with, uh, is it Seiki, Westinghouse, and Element Electronics to launch a slew of lower cost Fire TV powered 4K TVs. All TVs, they're actually not launching them. They, they announced them, but they haven't launched them yet. All TVs ranging from 43 to 65 inches will offer 30, or, sorry, three gigs of RAM, 16 gigs of internal storage, and a remote control with a microphone. That'll allow you to interact with none other than Amazon's Alexa Assistant because that's part of the Fire uh, ecosystem. Uh, no price or availability is listed at the moment, but Amazon does say to expect more details later this year. But uh, Fire TV going from like set top box to being integrated into these lower cost TVs. I have to imagine, you know, Amazon being Amazon, they are so close to sales data on all this stuff. Uh, that gives yep. them a real advantage in, in coming into a market like this and knowing what is the price point, the price category that we need to target in TVs to get our technology in there so that they sell like these other TVs do through Amazon. And then, and then what it's also going to do is it's going to fuel their, their own show development because oh, they're yeah. going to have a ton of data of what people are watching. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the thing that, that 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 Fire TV is reporting back to the Amazon mothership and saying what people are watching, how long they're watching it, how long they're watching their shows, how long they're watching other shows. And, you know, a, the Amazon Prime video offering is great, except that they built this walled garden around around it for you to access it. You can only access it on Amazon devices, whether you have a Fire Stick or, you know, the other different kind of you know devices that have it integrated. And I know a lot of people are like, yeah, I want to watch Mozart in the Jungle. I don't know how to get it. And if Amazon is going to release is going to partner with these companies, release well-priced TVs and then, you know, start really just putting it on the forefront of the living room, you can see a lot more people watching that content. Yeah. Uh, Amazon's video offerings have been yeah. kind of a challenge to find. For it's frustrating. Platform. It's, they, they, they've yeah. improved it over time, but it's just not yeah. quite not nearly as ubiquitous or seemingly ubiquitous as something like Netflix is where that's everywhere. You expect well, yeah, that I mean, that's to be everywhere. Exactly. We talked about where when you see a TV device get announced that it doesn't have Netflix, you're like, whoa, what's up? How come it doesn't have Netflix? Yeah. Whereas, you know, p people with a Apple TVs or Chromecast or anything like that haven't been able to access this Amazon stuff. But now if they buy a new TV and it's Amazon Fire stuff is already driving it and that stuff is one remote button away, then a lot more people will watch it. And then you can also watch your Netflix and your other stuff that you're watching with those devices. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Amazon doesn't have a button on this next uh, thing that we're going to talk about here. Dish Network. I noticed launched the Air TV player. It's an ultra HD 4K capable set-top box running Android TV. Pretty nice. It integrates Netflix and Sling TV along with over-the-air capabilities when coupled with an OTA antenna. So basically what this does, this allows for Dish to include local networks with its Sling TV service without the need for retransmission deals. So it all kind of works seamlessly together, which is a really nice way to kind of get around that. The Air TV player with OTA Air TV adapter runs $129.99. And then there's a streaming only version if you don't need that OTA uh, antenna capability for $99.99. Uh, I guess say aside from it looking like a Fisher Price, my <laughs> my streaming TV, yeah, kind of has that look. Uh, um, yeah, that box and that remote control looked, yeah, just a little like, hey, look, it's TV. Oh. But um, uh, really curious about with well, there's a Netflix button and a Google button, which is interesting. Yeah, for um, Google Play. 
Mm-hmm. Yep, exactly. But uh, this is really smart on their part. I mean, the sling offering is already pretty cool. I played with it when it first came out. I discontinued it just because I didn't want to pay another monthly subscription fee, but I recommend it to a lot of people. And as somebody who doesn't have cable, doesn't want cable, uh, has relied on my over the air antenna, this is something I would consider because now I can watch the Oscars and watch Netflix without having to, you know, uh, change the input or jigger what I'm doing or, you know, kind of play with my setup. It's all in one spot. Uh, this is, this is a nice device. I'm, I want to see, I want to see people play with it hands on to see really if the, you know, Android TV we already know is, is completely underutilized. So it's nice yes. to see that being, being used. Um, so this one, I would, this one I would like to play with if I can get my hands on one. Yeah, for sure. Um, if you are a sling TV user, you get $50 credit when you buy one of these. Ooh. So when you think about it that way, I mean, that ends up knocking the price down even further um, for money that you're probably already going to spend on a Sling TV subscription anyways. Um, and yeah, Dish, all, Dish also happened to announce, this is like the Alexa themed uh, top block, an <laughs> Alexa skill for controlling its Hopper DVR uh, with the Amazon Echo. So hey, if you've you got an that? Echo, you've got a bunch of new things coming at you. Hopefully you have Pretty the cool. other side of that technology to actually make it useful. So mm-hmm. uh, coming up, more news from the Consumer Electronics Show because there was a bunch. But first, let's take a minute to thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. They're the sponsor of this episode. And if you've ever gone through the process of applying for a mortgage, I mean, you've done the hard work of finding the house that you they, of your dreams. Then you have to go through this whole application process, which as necessary as it is, can be kind of challenging. You have to pull this information from all over the place. Hopefully you have access to it. And it's just kind of a drag to have to do that. Well, when it comes to the big decision of choosing a mortgage lender, uh, it's important to work with someone that you can trust who has your best interest in mind and who can kind of help hold your hand and make it easier for you. With Rocket Mortgage, you'll get a transparent online process that gives you the confidence to make an informed decision. You don't waste time searching through uh, stacks of old paperwork. With Rocket Mortgage, you can securely store your financial information uh, to get a mortgage approval in minutes. You can even adjust the rate and length of your loan in real time uh, to make sure you get the mortgage solution that's right for you, for your unique financial situation. Whether you're looking to buy a home or even refinance your existing mortgage, you can lift the burden of getting a home loan uh, by using Rocket Mortgage. They're just going to make the whole process much easier for you. Skip the bank, skip the waiting, and go completely online at quickenloans.com slash TNT. That's quickenloans.com slash TNT, equal housing and lender, licensed in all 50 states, nmlsconsumeraccess.org, number 3030. And we thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans for their support. So 2016 showed us how insecure uh, the Internet of Things is right now in a few different ways. The security company Norton, we've all heard of Norton, uh, has a home security device to protect IoT devices in the home and the Wi-Fi networks that they run on. Norton Core is, I think you would agree, a unique looking geodesic dome shaped router because they're all getting really creative with these things now and how they look. (laughs) Uh, that's meant to be out in the open. It's meant to be part of like a focal point of, of the room. Uh, has a multitude of access control features for guests, family, uh, by device. That includes prioritization settings. But it also does, and this is kind of key to keeping you secure, it does deep packet inspection for the data that passes through it for malware, viruses, and other baddies, um, giving the core the power to quarantine an infected device kind of in real time without you having to like run this software on your computer. I think that's the way to go, man. I mean, I almost feel like, you know, to a certain degree, and mind you, I've been on on a Mac, so maybe I fall in this like delusional world where I don't have to run antivirus or whatever, but I haven't run this stuff in years. And and the part of the reason I don't want to is because I always feel like my experience in the past was that it slowed things down. Maybe it wasn't entirely effective. It broke other things. Just the experience wasn't that great. If this is happening in the router and it's automatically updated, as they say, it's going to be updated over time automatically for you. You don't have to think about it. This seems like a really great approach. Well, yeah, and I think this is a direct response to just the changing way we're using network devices in that it used to be your computer was plugged into your router or your modem, and then that's what you had you had to scan on your computer. But now with phones and tablets and and game platforms and all these other dev- – how many devices we have going through our router – it makes sense to have the protection to you know to build the wall before it leaves your house at the faucet where the data is coming in. Yeah. Um, 
I just think it's fascinating because I, I, if you had gone to me a couple of years ago and say, hey, in 2017, a big trend is going to be routers, <laughs> I would not have believed. I thought we had solved it. I thought it was over. You know, like we the routers, they they do the job. You know, like it just is. It's 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 like a refrigerator or a microwave. You know, it just does does what it does. But seeing so many new routers come out with so many different things, and especially like you mentioned at the top, where it's like you know, it used to be these these routers were things you hid in the closet, and now they want them to be on tables and like objects of art and like you know. With with really nice industrial design, um, I think it's really interesting, and it's nice to see Norton kind of stepping up and building something that can protect all your devices in the home at once, one point of entry or exit from uh, your connection. Yeah, I mean, you know, the design aspect of these things is it's easy to overlook that and to think like, oh, well, that's just stupid. Why would anyone really care? You know, I, I have yeah. this for a purpose to drive, you know, Wi-Fi through my house. Why do I care what it looks like? But it actually makes a lot of sense if you make it look halfway decent, not like a big, ugly, clunky piece of technology, people are less likely to hide it in a closet and do these things that actually obstruct it from working the way that it should. You put it exactly. behind things, hide it behind things, that actually lowers your ability to kind of stream at higher speeds or, you know, better reliability, all that kind of stuff. Um, and yeah, it really seems like, I, like I agree, a couple of years ago, I probably never would have expected that 2017 would be about routers and everything. Yeah. But in hindsight, what I've realized, and especially since getting the Google Home, is that there was actually a lot of improvement to be made in our house in particular, you know, having our one single router in the living room. Like I now notice with Google Home just how much more more even evenly distributed everything is and uh, kind of seamless and high speed up upstairs as well as down. Like all these all these headaches that I had before that I just lived with because that's what routers do. You don't have to anymore. And they've kind of lowered the kind of complexity for how these systems work. Um, you know, this included, it's, it's all driven inside, you know, your software suite so that you can understand what devices are connecting, what devices should not be connecting, you know, how many IOT devices you have in your house that are passing through it. All of those are kind of protected by the security features of this. And that's, uh, yeah. I think that's a really great approach. I do think it's interesting that this geodesic dome looks to be the size of a head, which is it's much bigger than I thought it would be. So and it's funny because going going to the design thing, like the reason why those routers end up in the closets or, you know, tucked away is because of wives and girlfriends and husbands and significant others and who are design focused who are like, I don't want that thing out here. You know, now that's something that's kind of cool looking. I mean, you know, I, you know, the Google home has found a place in my, in this beautiful apartment where my girlfriend is very specific about what, what gets put out um, because it can fit in because it's, it's well designed. Um, and Hey, you know, you make me a device that looks like the Epcot ball and, and I'm, I'm more inclined <laughs> to buy it. So yes. Go. Why go, <laughs> why go to Epcot when you can bring Epcot yeah. to you? And protect Serious. your devices at the same time. There it's you go. The, it's, so. the be, it's the best case scenario of combining two things you always wanted uh, in one. Hopping on the in-home Wi-Fi mesh network train is Linksys, who unveiled the VLOP or VLOP. I'm not really quite sure. Uh, it's a tri-band system that um, that has a speed but prevents, sorry, speed drop-offs uh, that are noted in two-band systems. They say like Google Wi-Fi, which Google Wi-Fi is a two-band system. I don't really notice the speed drop-offs, but I guess I haven't really, you know, gone the super techie route on analyzing how it's working. Anyways, Linksys says the VLOP can uh, achieve the best Wi-Fi speeds around. Of course they do. At around $499, you better believe it should live up to that promise because that's pretty darn expensive. So you can see the three here. When I first saw it immediately, I was reminded of like, uh, old like '90s uh, multimedia speakers on your desktop. Not yes. the not the most impressive design in the world. I could see where like why they might have thought they might be kind of following the trend of it just blends in with things, but uh, it doesn't. Yeah, Linkson <laughs> needs to I think invest on the in, the in the industrial design department a little more. Yeah. I mean, there are on the right, but like when you compare this to the Google Wi-Fi. Uh, you know, solution with those little hockey pucks, little pucks. those white hockey pucks. I, I would go with the Google Wi-Fi over this. Oh, uh, yeah. It, it definitely looks like 90 speakers. It definitely like, <laughs> <laughs> well, and they're, you know, they're super tall actually. Um, so, I mean, the idea of blending these things in, and by the way, you don't have just one of them, you have three of them. So you've got to find spaces for them throughout yeah. your home. So that's going to be kind of a challenge. They're big towers, um, but it's integrated with Alexa Funny, isn't that crazy? Everything is integrated with uh, Alexa now, or integrates with Alexa, rather. Uh, Pre-order today, stores January 15th. Uh, they do sell them in, in less than three packs. The three-pack is $4.99, two-pack $3.49, a single is $1.99. So 
Um, I don't know. Maybe maybe they're really great. Maybe that three band versus two band is a big difference. They say that's part of the reason why this is much larger than yeah. um, solutions like the Google Home. I, I just don't, I can't believe we're talking about routers. I just cannot believe it's exciting it. stuff. I mean, man. I, I'm I'm glad I'm glad that there's progress and innovation, but I'm just I'm shocked. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's a trend. It's it's hot. Yeah. Uh, CES wouldn't be complete without at least a small sampling of robots. Today I have one for, one of those robots for you. Mayfield Robotics showed off its Kuri robot, which is designed to be informational and helpful. Uh, and they say a delight to be around thanks to its audible chirps and beeps. So it doesn't have like a voice necessarily that it talks to you. It's more done with beeps and, and bleeps and that sort of stuff. It has a 1080p camera uh, on the front that can be used as a security measure in your home. So like it can keep track of your home while you're gone. Uh, four microphone array that allows inhabitants, aka human beings, to talk to it and ask questions like, yes, of course, the example they always give is what's the weather, which made me go, wait a minute, I thought it couldn't speak, but I guess it can give you the answer to that. I, I hope I'm not deciphering that from bleeps and boops. Um, and then when not directly interacted with, it can wander the halls like Kane from Kung Fu, playing music, <laughs> reading audiobooks to you, turning off the lights when you forget to switch them off. Let's just hope you don't trip over it. What do you think? I, I like that they point out that it's delightful to be around because when I'm shopping for my home robot, I'm going to make a decision over which the light, which one's delightful and not delightful to be around. Um, th this looks a little like uh, this is we're one step closer to Rosie from the Jetsons. Yep. This, I think. <laughs> I think that's that's it right there. But really, when you think about what it does, it's not it's little, if not anything more than what what a Google Home or an Amazon Echo is. It's just that it has wheels and it goes from room to room. It's so, as if it's as if as if they pasted a Google Home or an Echo to a Roomba. Yeah, that's and exactly then gave what it, it is. And, and gave it gave a couple it. of eyeballs that <laughs> blink, and yes. and oh, it's horrifying. Uh, in some ways, it kind of looks like a Google Home with a with a bowling ball on top. Well, it's funny because I'm I'm in a one bedroom New York City apartment, and and I know I'd be tripping over this thing left and right. I so know, I right? Like, and I can't imagine you, Jason, with a multi story home. Well, right. what are you going to do? Those wheels are like this, this small, that thing's not going anywhere except, you know, and my, my, our main floor is actually two levels. Cause there's one part of our house that's like a step up. So, wow, that would, I mean, it would be limited to our kitchen and our living room. I'll tell that's, you, I'll tell you what, I'm going to, I'm going to give, robot. I'm going to give Mayfield robotics a tip, write the check to Disney license R2D2's likeness make this into an R2-D2 bot and you will sell millions. Uh, that's a no-brainer. Or or Wally. You, know, yeah. you could really well, go either direction. Is Wally really in the zeitgeist as much as R2 these days? I think I think R2 might be the better bet. Wally was like 10 years ago now, man. It was still great though, but... <laughs> was Wally 10 years? Yeah, it probably was actually. I think you were right. When was, was it? Like eight, 2008. Eight years. Nine yep. years ago. <laughs> Not to be exact, but there you go. Um, coming up, news outside of the Consumer Electronics Show is, like I said earlier, a little bit light. We found a few things worth discussing, though, so we'll talk about that. But first, let's take a minute to thank Epson, They're the sponsor of this episode. Epson's revolutionary cartridge-free EcoTank line of printers for home and office introduce a new age in printing. The EcoTank ET4550 wireless all-in-one printer does not use ink cartridges. Instead, it features an amazing, innovative, refillable ink tank, earning it the title of CES 2016 Innovation Awards honoree. No more out-of-ink frustration. It includes up to two full years of ink, equal to 11,000 black pages or 8,500 color pages. You can save up to 80% on ink with low-cost replacement bottles. You just fill them up when, when they're empty and you keep that bag stored away. And then when you need to, you just fill it up again. It's awesome. It's powered by precision core printing technology. It has auto two-sided printing and a 30 page auto document feeder. Uh, also easy wireless printing from tablets and smartphones. My experience with other printers is that that is never easy. Uh, here it is. And that's, that's awesome. Uh, all EcoTank printers deliver an unbeatable combination of convenience and value. With Epson's EcoTank line of printers, you're going to have the freedom to print without running out of ink. The Epson EcoTank system was named the 2016 Small Biz Windows Printer of the Year. Visit Epson.com slash EcoTank today to transform the way your home, office, or work group prints. For the best combination of ease and value, turn to the Epson EcoTank printers. That's E-P-S-O-N 
epson.com slash ecotank. And we thank Epson for their support. So a few other news items that we were able to, to kick up here. First, every year, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg challenges himself with something new. Last year's challenge, of course, was to build a home AI system. We talked all about that. I think it was called Jarvis. Uh, he spent a year learning Mandarin, uh, running 365 miles in a single year, just to name a few. This year, Zuckerberg's challenge to himself uh, is elevated in, in light of kind of recent events. Somewhat like a politician, Mark plans to visit all 50 states throughout the course of the year to talk with people about how they live their lives and how those lives have been affected by technology. He says that in many ways, technology has connected people, but also made lives more challenging. And he hopes to help find solutions, figure out ways to kind of solve some of these, uh, these divisions uh, between these two things. Um, I, I mean, I have to imagine, you know, part of this is kind of driven by a lot of the news that happened, you know, around kind of, and, and kind of the ongoing, uh, you know, fake news thing that, that people kind of attributed at least partially to Facebook throughout the last half of the year, and maybe even earlier than that. What do you think about this? Do you think this is a good, good goal for Zuckerberg? It really, it feels, it definitely feels political to me. Yeah, it definitely feels political. Um, I mean, good for him that he can afford to do this. That's cool. Uh, yeah, no kidding, right? I, I think I think that it's interesting. You know, the 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 fact that Facebook has connected so many people, and yet people who I talk to feel more and more isolated is a big issue. And if he wa is concerning himself with that, then and he feels the need to walk the earth like Kane from Kung Fu. There's your <laughs> second Kane reference um, to get perspective of the people who are using his company's products. Then I can't harm him for that. I, you know, I'm curious to see how that's going to what shape that's going to take if he's going to hold town hall sessions or there's going to be some sort of want to talk to Mark sign up here or if he's just going to walk up to people on the street and be like, hey, what, what phone are you using? You know, like, yeah, right. I don't know how I don't know how he's going to, you know, structure this, um, but, you know, good for him. Good, 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 good luck spending all that money. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, he says that we're kind of at a crossroads of the value that technology affords kind of where it's gotten to uh, so rapidly and the cost of disruption to lives and to jobs. We're actually going to talk about one of those in the next story. Um, I mean, the reality is Facebook is so big. Its influence, its power is so far reaching um, that it's it's hard to for so long. Technology companies have just kind of had the idea of, look, it's cool because it's technology. See this cool thing we're doing? Isn't it fun? Isn't it neat? Blah, blah, blah. And now it seems like we're kind of, there's a turning point happening here where, and hopefully the, the, the those that are kind of running these companies are, and it seems like Zuckerberg is, are realizing the impact that some of these decisions make, especially when you get into 1.5 billions of users of your product. It's no longer a here's a really cool thing we can do. Isn't it neat that we could attach a location to this blah, blah, blah. And it becomes something greater, like the impact, the, the kind of influence over how people think and how people live their lives and whether they feel isolated or not and the impact that has on their lives. All of these things are, are driven by a lot of these decisions that may have seemed pretty light initially. And maybe that's what this is part of. Well, yeah, I mean, and, and that notion of spending so much time talking about how cool we can, how cool is this stuff that we can build always makes me think of Jeff Goldblum in Jurassic Park, who says, right. you spent, you spent all this energy figuring out how you didn't stop to ask if you should, Right. you know, and, and I think that's some of the lessons that we're going to be looking into as, you know, we go further into the 21st century is, is the right way to apply this technology. Yeah, for sure. Uh, definitely related AI. We talk about this all the time. Replacing jobs is what we've been hearing over and over. Well, today we have a real world example of this. Fukoku Mutual Life Insurance, it's a Japanese company, is about to put IBM's Watson Explorer to work as an insurance claim worker, replacing 34 human employees in the process. The move, they say, is expected to increase productivity by 30%. I found that, by the way, I found this interesting just because there's like actual numbers associated with it. So you can kind of get a sense of, of some things instead of just being this esoteric thing that we talk about. Uh, increased productivity by 30%, they say. They have to spend an initial $1.7 million to install the system and then $128,000 for maintenance. But the company expects savings of around $1.1 million per year. That means that it's going to get a return on their investment in less than two years. So basically, they put the cash up out front, in front, 
they survive for two years. And then at that point, it's just all, you know, like they're, they're just making money off the fact that they made this transition. And uh, this is just kind of a real world example of how how a job can be broken down into like these easy, easily replicable steps by a machine and replaced entirely. And uh, it's kind of a small well, this- example, right? Like it's a 30... 30- 34 human employees, but you can imagine this scaling outwards and and what the impact that would be. Yeah, I mean, this this is just a continuation of the changes to the manufacturing line in, in automotive plants in the 80s, yeah, where you took true. you took the guys off the line and replaced them with those robot arms that attached transmissions. Um, but now they're f- filing insurance claims. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, this is the future. The future is artificial intelligence. Yep. And uh, finally, according to a new report by TrendForce, mobile payments are about to encounter significant growth in 2017. $585 billion was spent using mobile payment services last year. Uh, So this would be seeing, expecting a jump of somewhere around 25% this year in a single year. The report highlights that Apple Pay and Samsung Pay hold the advantage. Android Pay falling behind the marketing muscle of the other two solutions. I really... I don't know if I've seen a whole lot of marketing around Samsung Pay, but That's, the fact that it works everywhere, yeah, I don't know. What do you think? I mean, I, I, yeah, I find the the marketing muscle line to be a bit dubious because I don't really see, other than just you know stickers for Apple Pay or Samsung Pay or whatever. I mean, yeah, I think that there's really a last, that. yeah, I think there's a last mile problem for all these uh, mobile payment solutions. Period. But I don't see a ton of marketing being thrown by any of the companies. Yeah, and I wonder. Um, I mean, wearables aren't really a, a big deal much anymore, but, you know, I'm sure there's there's at least a little bit of a, an advantage that Apple Pay has because of kind of the seamless pay with the wearable if you happen to have one versus pulling your phone out. Like, I don't know. I don't really, I just don't use it. And I've tried and tried and tried to get myself into the habit of, of using these mobile payments. But it, ultimately, overall, they just seem more complicated to me than the way I'm used to paying. Maybe that's just curmudgeon me what about you i know you you were pretty hot on on uh, google wallet before it was yeah and then i stopped yeah yeah then i stopped using it i don't yeah. know i just uh, i mean it's just it's it, with the especially with the chip cards that that's become the fastest and easy just put, put the slide the card in and it works yeah. um I should revisit it. I haven't, honestly, I haven't been using Apple Pay. I, I'm Apple Pay. I've been using Android Pay um, as much as I used to for no other reason. I should see what 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 takes it here in New York and and see what adventures I can have. Maybe I'll do that as a little uh, assignment for January. Yeah, I mean assignments, and, that, and that's fine. But yeah. if if the fact is that that anyone has to like convince themselves to use it, like yeah, like it. If it's if it's gonna make your life easier, that should be the reason to use it. Oh well, I use yeah. it because why wouldn't I? It makes my life easier, and I don't necessarily feel like it does that. So I think a yeah, lot of people got, just don't use it. Yeah, it's got to be frictionless. It's gotta it's gotta minimize if it can if it can make me get out of Dwayne Reed faster than taking my wallet out and giving them my card. Then that's the value. Is, so. is your Google Home okay right now? It it looks uh. like it's <laughs> flashing at me. Oh, that's the. I think that's the refresh rate of the LED lights on my Christmas tree. Let me uh, <laughs> let me let me turn the Christmas tree off, and I'll see if that helps. <laughs> I thought your Google Home was like sending us a message or something. Like your timer's <laughs> going off. <laughs> Please <laughs> let me free. <laughs> uh, it's not. It's not. I don't think it's distracting. I, I, I think it's neat. Uh, TNT's <laughs> fan of the day is Zachary Sims on Twitter, who said, "This is how he watches TNT." at the office while uploading a course online. I'm very curious to know what the course is. But uh, there you go. Uh, many ways to watch TNT. If you're uploading a course, shouldn't you be doing the... Well, I guess you're you're at the end of the course if you're uploading it. So you've done your hard work. And while you upload, you reward yourself with tech news today. Show us how you watch or listen to TNT. Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup. You can post it on Instagram, Google+, Twitter, or Facebook and use the hashtag How I Watch TNT. And we're going to find it. I told you earlier we were going to save the best for last in this whole Alexa kind of thread that's followed through the entire show. Um, this is kind of related. Uh, can it read a book to your kid? We're going to answer that question. But first, let's take a minute to thank Tracker, the sponsor of this episode. Uh, Tracker, of course, helps you, pr- helps prevent you, uh, or at least kind of mitigate your losing of things. I'm pretty bad at losing things personally, so I need all the help that I can get. Uh, We're all actually probably pretty used to losing our possessions. Newsweek 
reports the average American wastes 55 minutes a day looking for things they own but cannot find. And Tracker is going to help make uh, losing things a thing of the past. And I'll tell you how to get one for free. The Tracker Bravo locates misplaced keys, wallets, luggage, instruments, bicycles, electronic devices, even pets in seconds. The coin size device is constructed with anodized aluminum for the thinnest, most durable tracking. You can attach it to pretty much anything. It has a key loop as well as adhesive for sticking it to uh, the things that you own. Tracker is enabled by Bluetooth LE, so the battery lasts up to one full year. You can add a laser engraved message if you want to customize the Tracker Bravo. Uh, things like return information or pet information. So when you put it on a pet's collar, they know the name and the phone number uh, to return the pet to. Uh, and you can now personalize your tracker with a custom printed image. You can pretty much put anything you want on there and customize it top to bottom. Pair your tracker with uh, the iOS or Android device that you already own, and you'll find its precise location with a tap of a button. Your phone can track up to 10 devices at one time, and you can customize two-way separation alerts so you're notified before you leave your item behind. If you lose your phone, you just press the button on the tracker and your phone will ring even if it's on silent. With over 3.5 million devices shipped, Tracker has the largest crowd GPS network in the world, so your lost item shows up on a map, even if it, if it happens to be miles away. And if you lose your item, the Tracker app records its last known location on a map so that when another Tracker user comes within a 100-foot range of your item, you will receive a GPS update of where your item is located so you can go get it. Go to thetracker.com right now and never lose your possessions again. Plus, just for our audience, if you enter promo code TNT, you'll get a free Tracker Bravo with your order. That's T-H-E-T-R-A-C-K-R dot com, promo code TNT to get your free Tracker Bravo today. All right, so toy maker Mattel is showing off what it calls the first smart baby monitor called the Aristotle. Uh, it has an increasingly standard tall cylindrical shape. Kind of looks a little familiar. They're, they're all having this like same kind of design approach here. Colorful base, of course, that houses the brains and the speakers in there as well as a separate uh, HD camera that you can use for monitoring your baby, let's say. The monitor collects nap and diaper change information. Uh, I can do things when baby wakes up from a nap, like turn on the lights or or run white noise, which is basically go back to sleep, kid, um, or sing a lullaby. Uh, it'll read a nighttime story to your kid if you don't want to be doing that, which seriously, you should be doing that anyways. Uh, and <laughs> it also includes games uh, as, for as the child gets older, I just, I don't know how I feel about this. What do you think, Rob? Well, I mean, I, I'm, I'm surprised this from Mattel. I'm glad to see them kind of expanding in that regard. I do have to question the the claim of the first smart baby monitor because I just did a Google search for smart baby monitor, monitor and I can find at least five companies that will question that claim. But are, uh, but are they smart? Uh, well, yeah, exactly. But, you know, the, the, and the thing is there's been baby tech for several years now. I know yeah. there was like – there was a smart mat for changing baby. Like it, it weighed your baby when you put it down when you changed the diaper and like did all this sort of sensor stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I know We Things has a – has the, there's a lot of camera stuff out there. It's neat to see Mattel combining into like the Amazon Echo, Google Home model of the cylinder that sits in the room. And and you can – I mean it, it's, it's using Bing for search and queries, which which is cool, right? Like it's just it's. It, I don't know. I'm not surprised. I'm more surprised it's from Mattel than anything. That that, that that other than the fact that it exists. I expect somebody to make this, but Mattel, I didn't expect that. <clears throat> well, that's just proof that everybody feels like they need to get into this category right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and I couldn't like everything I read mentioned Alexa, but I think just in in a this is very similar to Alexa sort of way, not that right. it's actually running or integrated with Amazon Alexa. So I wonder, I mean, you know, companies like Amazon, Google, they've poured so much money and R&D and all this sort of stuff into the development of their AI that runs these things. So I wonder if Mattel, little scrappy upstart, you know, toy company Mattel walks into the room and says, hey, we've got one of those too. How useful it is in the grand scheme of things comparatively it's probably more like a toy than than it is but but else. but that said i mean google home and amazon echo is great but it's not designed for the user experience of a baby of a baby that's true right 
That's I mean, true. like the, the the baby user experience is a lot different, you know. And so and it, what's interesting about this device is that not only is there stuff to monitor the baby for on the parent side, which most smart baby tech is, you know, it's it's monitoring for parents to see how the baby's doing. This actually is for interacting with the child, which is I don't think anybody is doing. So that that's really interesting. I think that's, you know, by, you know, Lord knows my friends who have kids and I know Jason, you can attest this when that baby starts crying at four in the morning, you know, and if this thing can start playing white noise and put the baby back to sleep and you get a couple more hours of sleep, that's probably a good thing, right? Yeah. Yes. On one hand, but. yes. On one hand, <laughs> when when it's four in the morning and your baby wakes up and all you want more than anything is sleep, um, th there might be that that kind of you know that thought that that using technology to do this in an automatic sort of way might actually help. And great, I can get some sleep. On the other hand, like I just I don't know if I'm personally I don't know if I would be willing to hand over pr parent control to technology for for a baby that young, right? Like there's, well, and there's, that's, there's and a that's connection the, that happens when you're involved with it. I mean, that's kind of the point of being a parent. Totally agreed. And I don't think any of these technologies should replace the, the connection a parent has with the child or a caregiver has with the child. Um, but this can, you know, this can be used to help augment it sure. and to help, you know, kind of help it. Yeah. Like, like don't let this thing read stories to your kids. You read the story to your kid. I agree with you there, you know, but you know, if it allows the kid, you know, as the kid grows up to ask questions and have somebody answer and play games and things like that, then it's just another device. I don't know. I think it's, yeah. I, I think it's a lot better than, 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 or potentially a lot better than people who just plant their kids in front of the TV or the iPad and let the kids zone out like zombies. So yeah, yeah I, I am curious to know what the kind of developmental process would be if a, if a, a, a baby began its life experiencing this sort of interaction from, you know, from the point yes. that it could, it's developing and, and, and onward. Uh, Rob uh, Fujioka, Mattel's chief product officer, actually said in this, um, in one of the articles that I read, if we're successful, kids will form some emotional ties to this. Hopefully it will be the right, ti right types of emotional ties. That's a dun, really weird dun, thing to say publicly. Dun, That's I really weird. <laughs> I know. Listen, I read Rob, that. I was like, I don't think you say that out loud if you're the, the chief product officer. I mean, I think Very it was strange. meant to address kind of potential concern around like what is the effect on a baby if, if this is what they're exposed to as a as an infant. Um, yeah. But that's just there's a little bit of uncertainty there. Uncertainty tied to the fact that they actually don't know because we haven't really done a whole lot of that, I would have to imagine up to this point. Oh man, yeah. No, I, I, I sometimes I'm excited for the future, yes, chill people of the world, and sometimes I'm horrified. So I don't know. I completely <laughs> agree. Equal parts both, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Ron Richards, thanks once again for hopping in the in the hot seat and uh, being being my co-host on today's episode. Really appreciate it. Yes, thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, it's it's uh, sorry about any Skype issues. The rain and Time Warner is never a good combination, but uh, it's always great to be here. And CES is so exciting, so much great technology, good that, stuff. That's okay because the audio has been a little out of sync, so it kind of runs yeah. with our uh, "Walking the Earth Like Kang" from Kung Fu um, theme. <laughs> uh, it's yep. kind of like an old Kung Fu movie, so it's been great. Yeah, there you go. Uh, there where you can go. people follow all the stuff you're doing? Yeah, so you can just follow me on Twitter uh, at twitter.com slash ronxo, uh, and that's where I post about everything I'm working on. Uh, real quickly, we do all about Android here on Twitter every Tuesday. If you like Android stuff, I'm sure, Jason, you mentioned that before. Uh, that's that's the go-to spot. Wow. There's our pretty faces. I haven't seen that um, picture yet. That's a really yeah, interesting picture. <laughs> There you go. Um, that was last time I was in town, it looks like. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, am, I, am I really angry? Uh, you look really angry. Yeah, <laughs> I think you're doing. It might have been the the let's go into the arena mode. I think. <laughs> I think that's exactly what I'm saying right there. Is let's go into the arena. Flo yeah. agrees. It's an interesting moment, and I'm I, and apparently I'm vamping directly for the camera, which is, is <laughs> which is odd too. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, uh, so all about Android. That's always a great time, and I'm sure we're going to talk about the cool CES Android stuff that, that's related yeah. to that for the next couple of weeks. Additionally, uh, over my other podcasts uh, over at ifanboy.com, where we're talking about comic books every week, uh, as well as comic book movies and uh, TV shows and geeky stuff. Um, so definitely head over there and subscribe to that show, um, as well as uh, Damn Fine Podcast at damnfinepodcast.com, where me and Tom Merritt are revisiting and reanalyzing Twin Peaks from the beginning. A uh, new episode comes out tomorrow, so definitely check it out. Awesome. Always fun, man. Uh, I will talk to you in 20 minutes for all about Android. I'll be here. <laughs> all right.
<laughs> Thanks again. Uh, tomorrow marks the triumphant return of Megan Maroney sitting right next to me at this table, and the uh, the band will be back together. TNT records live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, 11 p.m. UTC at twit.tv slash live. You can be part of the show by emailing us at tnt at twit.tv. You can leave us a short voicemail at 260-TNT-SHOW. You can find us on Twitter. We're at Tech News Today TV. Uh, you can find all the ways to subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TNT. And if you want to tweet at me, I'm at Jason Howell on Twitter. You can find me there. Uh, thanks to our technical director, Kara Cole. Thank you, Kara. Thanks to Burke for helping out in the studio. Thanks to Kevin for editing and hopefully making this uh, look, look better than we are. And thanks to you for talking tech with us today. We'll see you all tomorrow. Bye, everybody. Mm -hmm.